Engine response. In the fall, September and October, I think October, we have some of our biggest fires. So the fuel component is dead and it's, gonna, and it's done for the, the year and it's going into the winter and Colorado is dry. It's not just South Metro's district really, it's probably Colorado as a whole. Colorado is dry and people think, oh, it's October and the sun's only up, you know, eight to 10 hours a day and it's only 60, 70 degrees and what happens is we get low humidities and moderate temperatures and those winds. And so September and October are actually one of the times of the year that we get some of our biggest fires. So in Colorado, it isn't a fire season, it's a fire year. We can get something in January, we can get something in December. If we just don't have that snow around, we have the fuel component to carry that fire. I think the public is, is going, wait, that should be in the summer. That's when it's really hot. But we have to remember the red flag is lower humidities, increased winds, and an increase in temperature. It doesn't have to be 100 degrees to get a red flag warning. So, and you think about it, you know, if we don't have a good humidity recovery overnight, those fuels are already dry when that sun comes up. And then we get eight to 10% humidities during the day, and that fuel bed is ready to burn. And then we don't get a good humidity recovery again. So over that duration of days, it has not gotten that humidity to replace that moisture in that fuel, the grass. And so for us, we have those dry days, September, October, November. Oh, I mean, With that red flag, we know that that fire has an opportunity to grow quicker and faster on a red flag day. We have uh, different responses, a small grass fire, large grass fire. We automatically kick it right up to a large grass fire because it's gonna take less time for it to grow. And it's still gonna take us the same amount of time to get there. So we're gonna try and get as much equipment there as we can and keep it small. That's our goal is keep all the fire small. Our department's probably 80% urban interface. We have a lot of structures. Structures, we don't want anybody to lose their house. If it grows real fast, the bigger it gets, more equipment we're gonna need to put it out. So by keeping it small, that's less resources. And then if we say we have a group that's going in for structure protection, say a type one engine or a pumper, we're gonna put that at a house for structure protection. Every time that fire grows, it could be another house, then that takes another engine. And then another house, and then that'll take another engine. So those resources that we were gonna to use to fight the fire are now doing structure protection. So for us to keep it small, we benefit in that it doesn't take as many resources. First thing I'm thinking about is what do I have? What's it gonna be doing in 30 minutes and maybe what's it's gonna be doing in an hour? And if I think that we have a problem with this fire, then I'm gonna get a second, a full second alarm and get that personnel and that equipment there as soon as I can. That's the other thing is most of the time these grass fires are more of a rural area. So I get my first alarm there and those engines are within a couple miles. Now I go for a second alarm and now they may be 10 or 12 miles or it may be an automatic aid mutual aid. Every, every minute that we wait, it's coming from farther and farther away. And I may sit there and say, okay, it's flat ground, don't have a real big wind, but I know a wind's coming in an hour, so I may add a couple of brush trucks to it just to make sure that uh, we can really get a handle on the incident. Uh, the way I look at it is we can always get the equipment coming and if we don't need it, we'll turn it around. 
But when you have that delay and then you think, oh, 30 minutes ago I needed that equipment, then you're behind the eight ball. Uh, the grass fire depends on the topography and the wind, but pretty much it'll go as fast as that wind will push it. So historically, most fires in Colorado are wind driven. So if you have one start at the bottom of a slope and you have a, a wind that's lined up with that topography, it's gonna go as fast as that wind up that slope. It'll preheat the upper part. And then as you have a 30 mile hour wind, that grass fire could be going 30 miles an hour. So the type six brush truck is for, is for us is for a quick, mobile attack on a grass fire. So we can go off road, it's four wheel drive, carries depending on the equipment, three to 400 gallons of water in our district, has a nice pump, has some spray bars, and it's a crew cab so we can carry three to four people on it. We'll get on it, we'll have one person on a hose line, one person on a hand tool, and one person driving. And then as that we leave the road, we can get a good anchor point and we can do a nice mobile attack and hopefully suppress that fire real quick. Correct. So a bigger pumper, call them the pavement queens, they sit on the main road, they're very heavy, they have more water, but you can't, you do not take them off road. We would use them more for structure protection. So we, they could go up a driveway, it's usually an improved road, and they can work around the house where the brush truck's gonna go out in uh, what somebody would consider a pasture or an open field, and they can go off road, go through ditches, uh, four wheel drive, go through the sand, whatever it is, any of the small creek beds, uh, things like that. Now we have a hybrid brush engine fire truck that we call it, it's called a type three, and that's a little more versatile. It's more like a type six on steroids, I tell everybody. So it's uh, all wheel drive, it's a big cab, and it carries 500 gallons of water, and it can be off-road, or it could also be for structure protection. So it's a little more versatile. So maybe on one of the bigger engines as an option, if it can't leave the highway, and a brush truck, a type six or type three is not available, they can get to work right away. So they'll go ahead and these progressive packs carry a 100 feet inch and a half hose as a trunk line, which is a supply to the attack line. And that's a one inch hose and that's 100 feet. So they can connect directly to that big pumper that's on the road and they can do the same thing that the brush trucks do. And they can get a good anchor, be in the black, do a nice flank, and then try to pinch it off. And those progressive packs just hook to each other. So after each uh, pumper carries at least two, so that's 200 feet, they can get 200 feet out. The type six will carry 400 feet. And if we just feel the access is so poor, whether it's very steep or you can't get access from a type six or a type three, we'll go ahead and do a progressive pack. The other option is, is, is that we can drop those packs off at that big engine, go ahead and do a mobile attack on one flank of that fire, and then let that crew continue on with another three, four, five, six hundred feet, and then we'll meet them. We can get there as quick as we can, be as efficient as we can. Mother Nature may have another idea. So what we like to see is the homeowner over the previous years or time would mitigate their house, limbing up their trees, keeping a lot of trash away, wood piles, uh, items like that, keeping stuff away from their propane tanks and the brush not near the house. Most of the time, the structure is very resistant to the grass fire but if Mother Nature gets that grass fire up into the timber and up into the trees, and it's not safe for us, we're probably not gonna stick around, and then it's, it's harder to save that house. But by the homeowner protecting it themselves, keeping the brush cleared away, usually it works pretty good. If the fire gets in the trees, it's very, very difficult for us to control it. If the fire stays on the ground, we're gonna have a real good chance of keeping it small. Our special operations division will send us, say, hey, this helicopter is available out of Douglas County. These seats, are, which is a single engine air tanker, uh, might be available out of Jeffco or Centennial or uh, Front Range or in Northern Colorado somewhere. And so we'll plan on that. And then if I just know that we are not making headway on that fire and we're not gonna catch it and we're not gonna have enough resources to catch it, then we're gonna go ahead and order up that helicopter. And again, there's that time delay. So the sooner you make that decision, the better it is for the incident. And, and then if we need to feel like we need a seat and we need to lay some retardant down, uh, out ahead of that. So again, you're sitting there and going, okay, where's this fire gonna be in an hour? It's gonna take me an hour to get that helicopter here. It's gonna take me a seat, or an hour to get that seat here. You, you really have to look forward ahead. And what that air resource does as a helicopter, maybe an air tanker, is that we can start that nice anchor and flanking of that fire. And then we can have the helicopter resources stop the progression of that fire or the seat 
put a put a retardant line down in front of that to slow that down to help us give us the time to catch up to that fire. So what it does is it kind of slows the progression of that fire for us or knocks the heat out of it that we can really flank and pinch off that fire with our engines. Okay. So if we keep it in the grass, mop up is less than if it gets into the timber or runs through a timber patch. Then we got a lot of saw work, we got people falling trees. If they're uh, fire, if the fire had gone in and damaged that tree, we don't feel good about leaving it because then it, you know, the homeowner's there, it's somebody else's property. It could blow down in the wind, so we have to go through, cut all those trees down. Uh, basically, all those, we call them heavy fuels, have to make sure they're all out. So it's a lot of scraping and a lot more time intense. So for the red flag warning day, don't discard smoking items out your window. It doesn't take much. I mean, it, it's the truth. Cigarettes will start fires. The other thing is when they're out mowing their pastures, fields like that, a mower blade hits a, a rock, it causes a spark. Um, any, anything like that, welding, any of those items that you do outdoors, any of those chores, any of those daily chores that you're used to doing can cause a fire. And in a red flag day, lower humidities, higher temperatures, and increased wind, it's not gonna it doesn't take much to get that fuel bed ignited and then just, it's off.